Well, thanks for inviting me. It's been an exciting week so far. I'm going to talk about a recent paper with Fernando Pestowski, Benny Yoshida, and Daniel Harlow. Benny and Daniel are here. This has been an enjoyable collaboration, and fittingly, our initials spell happy. <laughs> Two of the most remarkable ideas I've ever encountered are the holographic principle and quantum error correction. The holographic principle is the best handle we have on a non-perturbative understanding of quantum gravity. Quantum error correction is the basis for our belief that we will be able to operate large-scale quantum computers that solve hard problems. These ideas are rather old by now. And the message of my talk is that they may be more closely related than we had appreciated. The holographic principle is concretely and powerfully realized in the ADS-CFT correspondence. It's an exact correspondence between a strongly coupled field theory on the boundary of an asymptotically ADS spacetime and weakly coupled quantum gravity in the bulk. There's a complex dictionary that relates the operators in the bulk theory to operators in the boundary theory. Loosely speaking, we can interpret the extra emergent dimension of the bulk theory as a renormalization group scale of the boundary theory, but it's actually quite non-trivial that the bulk theory is local even on scales that are short compared to the ADS curvature scale. And a recurring theme of the two programs that have been running at the KITP this spring is that there is a relationship between the entanglement structure of the boundary theory and the geometry in the bulk theory. Now, quantum error correction is the idea that we can recover from errors which occur due to the interaction of a system with its unobserved environment. Those interactions can cause a system and its environment to become entangled, driving decoherence of the system. But that decoherence can be reversed. We can apply a unitary map to the system and some ancilla that we control which can transform entanglement of the environment with the system into entanglement of the environment with that ancilla, which we can then discard and replace by a fresh ancilla for future rounds of error correction. Now, that won't work for arbitrary interactions between the system and the environment. Normally, we're content to consider the noise to be weak and weakly correlated. So the error operators, which occur acting on the system with appreciable amplitude, act non-trivially on a small fraction of all of the qubits in the system. Um, even so, we won't be able to protect arbitrary states, but only states in some appropriately chosen code subspace of the full Hilbert space of the system where that code subspace is chosen so the operators, the errors that we wish to be able to reverse, act trivially on the protected data. And so what I'm going to talk about is a quantum error correcting code which provides a model for the bulk boundary correspondence, a family of codes which we call holographic quantum codes, this is a tensor network realization of holography based on a tiling of a bulk ADS space, which can be chosen to be uniform in the bulk. I'm not going to attempt to talk about dynamics, and I'm not going to talk about locality at sub-ADS scales. But what we will discuss is a quantum code where we can interpret the physical variables of the code the qubits making up a code block as residing on the surface of a negatively curved space, and the logical operators which act on the protected system as residing in the bulk. There will be an explicitly computable dictionary between bulk and boundary observables, and a computable entanglement structure on the boundary which evokes properties of the ADS-CFT correspondence. 
I'm not attempting to give the complete dictionary of the correspondence. There's really an exact relationship between the bulk and boundary theories. Every state and operator on the boundary corresponds to some state or operator in the bulk. Here we're going to be confining our attention to a subspace of all the states of the boundary theory, which you may think of as the low lying states, the low energy states of a CFT, and the operators that we'll be interested in corresponding to operators residing in the bulk are those that map low energy states to other low energy states, that is, which preserve that code subspace. Now, I'm going to I'll remind you of some properties of the ADS-CFT correspondence, mention how they're realized in these codes, and then I'll explain how the codes are constructed and we can infer these properties. Lenny spoke of precursors earlier, and there's some standard lore about how local operators in the bulk can be reconstructed on the boundary, and there's more information than I'm going to take the time to discuss on this slide about that. But suffice it to say this, if I consider some connected region on the boundary, labeled A, I can consider a geodesic in the bulk which connects together the boundary points of A. And there's a region in the bulk in between A and the geodesic which is called the causal wedge of A. And the standard constructions tell us that if there's a local operator in the bulk acting at a point X in the causal wedge of A, then that operator can be reconstructed on the boundary with support only on A. Now that reconstruction is highly ambiguous. There are many ways of choosing the region A such that the point X is contained in the causal wedge of A. And that ambiguity was discussed in a recent paper by Elmeri, Dong, and Harlow, which provided the impetus for our work. And they observed the following puzzling feature. I can consider some point deep inside the bulk, and I can imagine dividing the boundary into three regions labeled A, B, and C. And then this point in the bulk will be in the causal wedge of the union in A and B. That means the corresponding boundary operator can have its support on A, B and no support on C. And so it will commute with any operator supported on C. And likewise, the same point resides in the causal wedge of B, C or of A, C. So the reconstructed operator can be chosen to commute with any operator in A or with any operator in B. If it commutes with any local operator in A, B, or C, then it has to be a multiple of the identity since the local field algebra on the boundary is irreducible. And that doesn't sound right. We should be able to reconstruct non-trivial operators. And the resolution of the puzzle that these authors suggested is that these three reconstructed operators actually are different operators acting on the full physical Hilbert space of the CFT, but they act in the same way on a code subspace. And it's in that sense that they are equivalent descriptions of the same bulk operator. And we'll see that holographic codes provide a concrete realization of that picture. Another thing that we'd like to address is the question of reconstruction of operators in the so-called entanglement wedge. I could consider, for example, a region on the boundary which consists of two connected components separated from one another. And then the entanglement wedge is, de is defined as the bulk region in between A and the minimal geodesic that connects together the boundary points of A, which if uh, the connected components are large enough, as in this picture on the right, can contain a region that goes deep into the bulk beyond the causal wedge of either component of A. So the standard reconstruction methods don't tell us how to find the operator corresponding to this bulk operator supported on A, but it's been suggested that such a reconstruction should be possible. And we'll see that in holographic codes, we can see how the reconstruction of operators in the entanglement wedge, but far beyond the causal wedge can be realized. One reason for claiming that operators in the entanglement wedge should be reconstructable 
is this. Uh, we can imagine having entangled pairs in the bulk where one member of the pair is within the entanglement wedge and the other is outside. And it has been argued that that entanglement in the bulk should contribute to the entanglement between the region A on the boundary and its complement on the boundary. And if that's uh, the case, and if that entanglement on the boundary has some operational meaning, then there should be an operator in region A which acts non-trivially on the member of the pair which is contained in the entanglement wedge. Now another thing we've heard a lot about in the last few days is holographic entanglement entropy, the observation of Ryu and Takianagi, that if I consider a region on the boundary, let's say a connected region A, that the entanglement of A with its co complement on the boundary can be computed by finding the minimal geodesic in the bulk which connects together the boundary points of A and expressing it in suitable units or in higher dimensions, a minimal surface with that same boundary. And as a Swingle discussed a while back, there are tensor networks which have a similar feature in which we can relate entanglement on the boundary to a minimal cut through the bulk, suggesting a connection with holography. And we'll see that in holographic codes, we can find an exact realization, at least in some cases, of the Ryu Takianagi formula. So these are some of the properties that we'd like to understand better and see reflected in these code constructions. So now let's see how the codes are built. The central concept in the constructions is what we call a perfect tensor. It arises in the following way. Suppose we consider a quantum state, a pure quantum state of two n spins, where each one of those spins is v-dimensional. And I can consider expanding that pure state in terms of an orthonormal basis. And that defines a tensor with two n indices, each of which takes v values. We say that tensor is perfect if, for any way of choosing n of the spins, those n will be maximally entangled with the complementary n spins. So for my pictures and the code constructions that I'll be showing in the figures, we're going to consider the case where we have a perfect tensor of six qubits. It's not obvious that such a quantum state exists, but it does. There is a quantum state of six qubits with the property that I can choose any three of the six and those three will be maximally entangled with the complementary three. So that tensor defines not just such a state, but also a unitary transformation from any three of the qubits to the remaining three. And also an isometric, that is inner product preserving map, from two of the qubits, any two, to the remaining four, or from any one of the qubits to the remaining five. And those two to four and one to five maps are actually the isometric encoding maps of quantum error correcting codes that protect against the erasure of one qubit or two qubits respectively. So what does that mean? We say that qubits are erased if those qubits are removed from the code block, become inaccessible. But we know which qubits were removed, and we can use that information in recovering from the error and reconstructing the code block. So let's suppose that in the case of the map from one qubit to five, defined by a perfect tensor, I introduce a reference qubit R, which is maximally entangled with the protected qubit of that code, that qubit embedded in a block of five, and then two of the qubits are erased, any two. But then because this is a perfect tensor, the reference qubit and the two erased qubits will be maximally entangled with the remaining three unerased qubits. So that means the reference qubit is completely uncorrelated with the erased qubits, and in fact is maximally entangled with the subsystem of the three unerased qubits. So that means I can recover the protected qubit just by applying a decoding map to the three unerased qubits, the other two qubits 
are not needed. And likewise, I can apply any logical operation that I want to the protected system of the code by acting on any three of the five qubits, which I'm free to choose. So a holographic code is obtained by building a tensor network from perfect tensors associated with a tiling by polygons of hyperbolic space or of a higher dimensional um, negatively curved space. Uh, so, for example, I can consider a tiling of the Poincaré disk by pentagons and associate with each one of those pentagons this code which embeds isometrically one qubit in a block of five and then I can stitch those tensors together and then there will be two types of dangling indices which are not contracted ones on the boundary and also the ones in the bulk associated with each one of the pentagons. We are not to think of those two types of indices, the ones in the bulk and the ones on the boundary, as two separate systems, but rather what the tensor network describes is the isometric embedding of the qubits residing on the pentagons in the Hilbert space of the qubits residing on the boundary. We can think of it this way. Suppose we start with the central pentagon where we've encoded one qubit in a block of five, but then we uh, compose that isometric map with other isometric maps. The important feature of the tiling is that each one of the pentagons has at least three of its indices going outward towards the boundary. So if I compose the isometries together, working outward starting at the middle, then each one of these perfect tensors describes an isometric map of its incoming uh, indices, which are contracted, and the incoming logical index on the pentagon to the outgoing indices. So the whole contraction describes a composition of isometries, and therefore an isometry mapping all of the bulk indices into the boundary Hilbert space. Now there's an analog of this ads rindler construction of the bulk operators which live in the causal wedge. We can define what we call a greedy geodesic and a corresponding greedy causal wedge bounded by that greedy geodesic and a boundary region A, let's say a connected region A. And this greedy geodesic is construct, well, first of all, the point is, that any bulk operator which acts in that causal wedge can be reconstructed on the boundary region A. The greedy geodesic is constructed in the following way. I can start out on the boundary region A and then in a series of small successive steps push that cut further and further into the bulk until I can push it no further and I'll be able to push the cut into the bulk if the cut crosses um, at least three of the indices of a hexagon or a pentagon. Because then when I move the cut past the tensor, I have an isometric map of the indices which are now crossed by the cut and the additional bulk index that's been encountered to those outgoing indices. So I keep pushing the cut further and further into the bulk until I'm not able to push it any further. I've reached the greedy geodesic. But now I have an isometry taking all of the indices crossed by the cut and all of the bulk indices that we've encountered to region A. The word greedy, by the way, is used by computer scientists to describe an optimization algorithm which proceeds in a sequence of small steps. It's not guaranteed in general that the greedy geodesic will agree with the true minimal cut, which has the same boundary in A, but it does in some cases. Now, we can see how to get the ryu takayanagi formula in the following way. Let's, uh, to keep things simple, 
Consider the case where there are no bulk indices at all. We have what we call a holographic state in which all indices are contracted except for the ones on the boundary. And it, the following is a graph theoretic fact which can be proved using uh, max flow min cut ideas similar to what we heard earlier from Matt Hedrick, which is that if I have a connected region A, and if the bulk is a tiling of a space with non-positive curvature, then the greedy geodesic of A and the greedy geodesic of its complement will coincide and will in fact be the minimal cut through the bulk which has the same boundary as A. So that means that the procedure of reaching the greedy geodesic from A and from A complement defines two isometric maps. P which takes the indices along the cut to A and Q which takes the indices along the cut to A complement and those two tensors are contracted. Because these are isometries this then generates a Schmidt decomposition of the holographic state and the number of uh, terms in that decomposition is just the number of values of the indices along the cut which is the dimension of the spin raised to a power which is the length of the cut. And so this state, uh, the marginal state of A will be a maximally mixed state in a, a subspace which has that dimension and the entropy is just the log of that which is the length of the cut times the log of the dimension of the spin and that's the Ryu Takianagi formula in this setting. In other cases when we do have uncontracted indices in the bulk or when the region A is not connected, we may find that the two greedy geodesics of A and its complement don't coincide. There's some tensor caught in the middle, a residual tensor, and that will give rise to a small correction to the Ryu Takianagi formula, which you could regard as a kind of lattice artifact. Does this argument work in higher dimensions or only in the dimensions you were stating? Well, we've only, we've only worked out the argument in the, uh, in the case of the two-dimensional bulk, but um, I think it would probably work. Um, and so now we'd like to see whether operators which are deep in the bulk but well outside the causal wedge can be reconstructed. The difference between the entanglement wedge and the causal wedge is most dramatic if we consider a region A which is the union of many disconnected components with small gaps between the components then the causal wedge reconstruction tells us how to um, reconstruct operators which are contained in the causal wedge of any one of the connected components but the entanglement wedge can be much bigger if the minimal geodesics connect together the boundary points of neighboring regions. And so we'd like to see that operators that live deep in the bulk can in that case be reconstructed on region A. What's easier to analyze is the following related question. Let's suppose we have an independent and identically distributed erasure process on the boundary in which each one of the qubits on the boundary is erased with some probability p or unerased with some probability 1 minus p. And then we'd like to know if the logical operators deep inside the bulk can be reconstructed on the unerased qubits. Well, let's first consider an easier case to analyze in which the graph is a tree. This is what is called a concatenated code in quantum coding theory. We can imagine that we encode one qubit in a block of five as I've described, but then each one of those five qubits in the code block is encoded again in a block of five and each one of those again in a block of five. So we obtain a tree graph which uh, branches one leg to five over and over again many times. Now this five qubit code has the property that we can correct, correct two erasures. So for the information to be destroyed, at least three of the qubits in the block have to be erased. 
So we can imagine starting at the boundary and level by level working our way inward towards the center trying to correct the erasures. And at each level we'll fail to correct the erasure only if at least three of the qubits have been erased at the previous level which are coming into that vertex. So the probability of an uncorrectable erasure when we reach level j plus one coming in from the boundary will go like the cube of the probability of a failure of erasure correction at the previous level. And if the probability of erasure is small enough, the probability of failure will drop dub very rapidly, doubly exponentially with the level as we go further and further into the bulk. And so if the probability of erasure is small enough with very high probability, we'll be able to reconstruct the central qubit on the unerased qubits. So we can do a related analysis for holographic codes. It's a bit more complicated because now as we work in from the boundary to the bulk, uh, a polygon at level J can connect to two polygons at the next level N. And that means that although the erasure process on the boundary might be IID, that won't be the case as we consider higher levels, there will be noise correlations which we have to take into account in the analysis. But it's not so bad because of the narrow causal cone coming from the hyperbolic geometry. So we never have to worry about correlations and erasure beyond nearest neighbors. And it's possible to do the analysis and show that if the probability of erasure on the boundary is below a critical value, then with high probability we will be able to reconstruct operators acting at the center. In fact, uh, we expect and can numerically verify that the correction works as long as the probability of erasure is less than one half. So the statement is that if I consider um, a random subset of all the qubits on the boundary which contains a bit more than half of the qubits on the boundary then with very high probability we'll be able to reconstruct the operator at uh, the center of the space um, on those qubits, on those unerased qubits. So I've told you about a family of quantum codes, a new family of quantum codes, which we call holographic quantum codes. They capture rather nicely some of the familiar features of full-blown gauge gravity duality and they provide in this toy model an explicit dictionary relating the bulk and the boundary observables. They illustrate explicitly how quantum error correction can resolve the causal wedge puzzle as Omeri et al. suggested and how operators which are uh, deep in the bulk beyond the entanglement wedge can be reconstructed. They realize exactly the ryu takianagi relation between boundary entanglement and bulk geometry with small corrections in some cases. The code construction is rather flex flexible. We can use various tilings of the bulk geometry um, and uh, different choices of the bulk operator algebra that we want to study and we can do similar things in higher dimensions. So far we have uh, not included in the discussion any dynamics or specified a Hamiltonian for which the boundary state is uh, the ground state and we haven't explicitly addressed issues of sub ADS bulk locality because our lattice spacing is comparable to the curvature scale. But this is an interesting code family which might have applications beyond quantum gravity, potentially to quantum matter or to fault tolerant quantum computing. But I think this has been an exciting project to work on because it's a further indication of which we've seen many in recent times of the richness of the interaction between quantum information and quantum gravity and that makes me optimistic about the prospects for future progress. Okay, thanks for listening.
All right. <laughs> Lenny, question. Now, is that T epsilon equals a half the same statement that you can recover from a ratio of up to half the qubits? Yes. I'm a little surprised because um, I would have thought that was a property of a system where everybody is maximally entangled with everybody else, and the boundary is not quite like that. It's not that entangled. It's only for the one in the center. Right? Yeah. Um, oh. So I guess a point that pro probably I should have emphasized more, but it's actually quite important, is that, and um, is that the protection against error is better and better for the qubits that reside deeper and deeper okay, in the bulk and best right at the center. And that uh, you know corresponds to the feature of precursors that they become more and more non-local for bulk operators which are deeper and deeper in the bulk. Tom, yeah. John, you of course explicitly said you, you weren't doing dynamics, but I, I do want to ask a question whether you've thought about, we think dynamically we can change the system in such a way that the geometry in the interior changes. Do you imagine that that requires changing your tensor network, or what is the, how, do you have any ideas about how that would Well, work? we, um, this isn't really an answer to a question about dynamics, but rather about how to modify the kinematics for other states on the boundary. Um, of course, most of the states in the boundary correspond to big black holes in the bulk. And I've been describing something that looks like a nice, smooth ADS geometry in the bulk. So if I wanted a tensor network representation of a typical state, it would have a huge hole in the middle, and there would be dangling bulk indices everywhere along the surface of that hole, which would correspond to the microscopic degrees of freedom of the black hole. I have a question about this picture. I mean, here you have encoded uh, qubits, which are also, uh, I think, uh, could be uh, describing some complicated entangled states. Uh, do they contribute to your entanglement calculation? So you're talking about the picture on the top? On the top, yes. So I take the red dots right. as being the encoded bits, and you right. want to be able to describe states that probably are not just product states in those qubits. Right. So you, I, I think what you're asking is, suppose that the bulk degrees of freedom were entangled. Would that contribute to the boundary entanglement? And indeed it would. But it would not be the area of law. That that's right. And so uh, that's, uh, in fact, part of the reason that for the Ryu Takianagi analysis, I said, let's consider the case where we have no bulk degrees of freedom. OK, good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but here you, okay, but, all right, fine. So, uh, I would like to follow there. up on this question, the, the same question. So, uh, uh, presumably, I would want to take these red dots, and if they are in the minimally entangled state, which means they are, they are not entangled, they are in a product state, then the real Nagy formula should uh, work for that state. Right? Or is that, is that true? If, if they are in, uh, in what state, sir? Pro product state, just. Oh, product yeah. state. Well, in fact, um, it doesn't quite work exactly in our analysis. There are these small order one corrections coming from these uh, residual tensors in that case, but it more or less works. So the small, small corrections are, means that there is some small mutual information? Well, it, mean, it means that when we consider a region on the boundary which has some order one number of connected components, there's an order one correction. Uh, John? Yeah. Uh, the reason I asked the question about dimension is um, if you have uh, the hyperbolic disk and you have two points at infinity, then there's a unique geodesic connecting them. Mm -hmm. But it's not true in higher dimensions that if you have uh, like a curve on the boundary of a three-dimensional hyperbolic wall or in higher dimensions, that there's a unique minimal surface mm -hmm. that asymptotes to it. So I wonder, does that affect this greedy argument you, that you'll meet from the two sides? Well, I am not sure. Uh, the, way we, uh, the way we do the argument, um, 
is we consider a um, we show that there's actually a quantum circuit that describes uh, the mapping from you know the minimal geodesic uh, to the boundary, and that we have um, you know a unitary a unitary quantum circuit going in in either direction. And the tricky part of that is to show that there are no closed time-like loops if you try to assign an orientation to each one of the edges, because then it wouldn't have a quantum circuit interpretation. It has to be an acyclic graph to correspond to a quantum circuit. And so if that would work in the higher dimensional case, we could make a similar argument. Okay, let's talk. Any more questions? Well, if not, then let's thank John again and we go for lunch. Thank you.